With Juhui's guard now gone, Hanram once again asks her why she's not at school. This was her chance to tell someone everything. She is about to speak when the thought of her little brother all tied up by the priest stops her words. If she makes a wrong move here, then her brother will be in danger. Unfortunately, the moment disappears as Hanram's friend, Yu, appears. Yu sees that Hanram knocked out someone once again and berates her. She pulls Hanram away before she can cause any trouble. Hanram manages to shout out to Juhui to contact the TRPA if she ever needs help and the two women disappear, leaving Juhui alone. Later, Yu is in a shopping center trying out swimsuits when she notices that Hanram is distractedly looking at the flyer Juhui had handed her. Hanram can't help but be bothered about the contents of the flyer, telling people how there are demons at school. Yu quickly catch a looked attention and asks her why she looks distracted when Hanram was the one who excitedly invited her to the beach for her vacation. Is it because of the flyer? Hanram crumples the flyer and realizes that maybe the girl earlier is just a hired help and not really a believer. She had told the girl about the TRPA and that should be enough. During dinner, Juhui is invited by the priest to dine with her. Juhui doesn't enjoy expensive food because she would rather eat with her family than eat delicious food with someone she hates. While eating, the priest asks her about the incident with Hanram earlier and asks her if the violent woman told her anything. Juhui assures him that she didn't but the priest smirks and points out that is exactly what someone hiding something would say. Suddenly, a server changes the food she was eating to a bowl of dog food. The priest then orders her to eat it if she still has faith. When Juhui hesitates, the priest snaps his finger and her brother Juhiyuk enters the room. Upon seeing the bowl of dog food, Juhiyuk immediately starts devouring it like a starving dog. Juhi tries to stop him, but the priest explains that Juhiyuk has been fasting for the last three days for his repentance ritual. Juhi seemed to be lacking fate lately, but her brother volunteered to do the ritual for her. Juhi insists that she's not lacking faith, but the priest comes over to her and grabs her face. He then informs her that in his years of leading the ministry, he has learned to determine whether a person has faith just by looking at their eyes, and Juhui's eyes are clearly lacking. The next day, the ministry is back to their normal ceremonies at the church with Juhui listening with her brother. Juhui prays to the holy deity, to Allah, to Buddha, and even to the demons. She wishes that someone murders their priest. At that moment, a red-haired demon named Hanram suddenly enters, shouting about how her interaction with Juhui wouldn't stop bugging her. The adult that Hanram knocked unconscious yesterday quickly shouts out that she was the demon who attacked them outside. This starts a chain reaction of yelling and screaming by the other believers for her to be burned at the stake. However, the priest calms them down and points out that Hanram is still a living creation of their holy deity, and as such, has the right to hear their sacred teachings. With that, Hanram resolutely sits beside Juhui and happily waves at them. After the ceremony, Hanram goes and introduces herself to the priest as a warden of the TRPA, while Juhui serves them tea. She explains that she helps students, teachers, and parents whose rights to education are being violated. And according to the flyer she got yesterday, their organization sees schools as demons' lairs. Thus, she can't turn a blind eye to them, especially when numerous kids are attending the ceremony earlier. One of the adults gets offended at that, but the priest calmly holds him back and agrees with Hanram. Children still need to learn, which is why they have an alternative school run by their holy order. In fact, he even volunteers to show it to Hanram. Later, the priest and Hanram are headed into the countryside where the school is said to be located. To Hanram's surprise, the school was a quaint little place where happy children can be seen spread all over the place. Some are playing, some are sleeping, and some are listening to a teacher. The priest explains that they don't dictate what children want to do. They can play a rest when they want to, and then listen to lessons when they're ready. Hanram asks if they even teach a proper curriculum, but the priest points out that curriculums of today only barrage students with monotonous cramming for exams, thereby disregarding student individuality. Students nowadays just study to compete in entrance exams and not focus on any character building. And when these children become adults, they do the same thing to their children making society an endless loop of competition. That is the hell called the education system. Compared to that hell, however, the kids in their holy congregation are all smiling. One child even happily approaches them and hands the priest a bouquet of flowers she collected. Hanron knows that alternative schools tend to have more loose systems based on the values of the parents. These can cause issues due to the confined nature and freedom from the supervision of the government. But seeing the school before her, she was glad that this one didn't seem to have issues. 
She thanks the priest for his hospitality and is about to leave, but before she goes, the girl hands her a flower. She then tells Hanram, Come back anytime, Mr. Policeman. Hanram laughs and explains that she's not actually a policeman and she's a woman, but the mistake suddenly changes the girl's expression and the priest who is looking down with contempt on the little girl. The fleeting look of contempt fades away from the priest's face before Hanram can notice and he explains to Hanram that a policeman came to visit them recently so the girl might have just been mistaken. However, Juhui who was watching from afar was hopeful that Hanram might notice the mistake and dig deeper. In the past, that same little girl practiced all day long sending her lines while being struck by adults when she got it wrong. The whole thing was a carefully constructed act forced by the adults on the children when outsiders came to visit. They often have police or reporters snooping around because of their cult-like behavior so the kids were forced to memorize lines to deceive them all. Only through countless beatings and endless hours of rote memorization were they able to perfect their act. And so it successfully fools any policeman that visited them in the past. But now a mistake occurred just because they practiced for a male policeman, not a female teacher. Juhui prays to the gods that Hanrim noticed this error. Meanwhile, Hanrim is looking around and is starting to notice small peculiar details in the school. The kids listening to the teachers are all different ages, the kids having fun catching dragonflies are just waving their nets around, and now this girl is saying something obviously wrong. However, she can still do nothing based on a hunch. She decides to just come back next time with Huijin. Nevertheless, she is still pessimistic that they can do anything since no one is asking for help. Thankfully, Juhui suddenly grabs her and begs her not to go. Juhui starts confessing every bad thing in the place, with how they're just forced to act, and that in reality, they just get beat up on the farm if they don't work hard enough. If they say they want to leave, they get tortured and locked up for several days. Juhui then points out that the little girl, Suyul, is already nine but still cannot add, subtract, or even read. They just want to go to school. Hanrim asks the priest if this is all true, but the priest points out that Juhui is just going through puberty and is in her rebellious phase. He then grabs Juhui and asks her to remember what happened to her little brother yesterday. But instead of being coward, Juhui pushes the priest away and shouts out to Hanrim that the priest also calls her every night and touches her everywhere. The priest strikes Juhui multiple times for her insolence, but Hanrim immediately intervenes and punches the priest back. The priest yells out to all his adult subordinates to attack Hanrim and brands her as a witch that came to defile their sanctuary. The adults armed with various tools surround Hanrim, who laughs at her new nickname. Someone attacks her but she kicks them back and steals their two hammers. She then remarks that outside Korea, her enemies gave her a codename, Baba Yaga. Meanwhile, Huijin continues tackling cases one after another for the TRPA with Hanrim gone on vacation leave. He now must take on four cases a day instead of two. He looks into the sky and wonders if Hanrim is enjoying her vacation right now. Well, Hanrim is indeed enjoying her vacation by bashing in the heads of the adults trying to attack her. The priest is dumbfounded upon watching Hanrim take on his whole congregation, yet still ends up winning. When all the guards are now down, Hanrim approaches the priest and grabs him by the throat. She asks him if all the allegations Juhi said are true, but the priest just starts spouting off passages from their holy book. Meanwhile, the little girl sees Hanrim choking their priest and savior, and she notices a sickle dropped by one of the earlier adults. When Hanrim tries to cuff the priest, the little girl suddenly stabs her in the thigh. The priest smirks as Hanrim pushes away the girl, but two kids also grab Juhui. Even Juhiok joins in on the action by attacking his sister with a sickle while spouting off holy passages. Hanrim tries to jump in to save her, but the little girl grabs her injured leg and hugs it, causing Hanrim to fall over in pain. When she looks up, more kids have now surrounded them armed with sickles of their own. A few days later, Weijin happily greets Hanrim at the office only to find out that she still hasn't returned from her leave. Annoyed at his co-worker, he attempts to call her, but all his calls get redirected to voicemail. Unbeknownst to him, Hanrim and Juhui are currently chained up at the headquarters of a cult. Weijin immediately gets worried upon hearing the voicemail message, since she knows Hanrim would always answer her calls. Military personnel never turn off their phones in case they get summoned for an emergency. Meanwhile, the priest stares at Hanrim's well-developed body with insidious thoughts and his hand slowly hovers near her chest. However, Hanrim tells him that he shouldn't probably add sexual assault to his ever-growing list of crimes. The priest backtracks and explains that he's just checking her wounds. 
Hanrim warns him that her colleague is probably looking for her right this moment so they should just turn themselves in for a lighter sentence. Instead of answering, however, the priest just shows Hanrim a letter of resignation for her to sign and implores her to convert to religion and use her sense of justice for their holy work instead. Hanrim sighs and asks them if they're planning to torture her until she agrees to sign the letter. However, the priest just smiles at her and informs her that they're not that barbaric. The next day, Hanrim and Juhui are brought outside tied up in their chairs in front of the whole congregation. The priest starts narrating to them how a believer among them was possessed by one of the most powerful demons in existence, which is why they will be performing the most powerful form of exorcism today, trashing. Hanrim realizes she will be lynched by all these people, but she observes that she can probably endure until Wajin arrives. Two adults from the group approach the tied-up girls and suddenly start smacking Juhui. Hanrim quickly argues to the priest that she should be the one being hit, but the priest replies that since she's a non-believer, then she's not qualified to participate in the ceremony. That means the one getting lynched is Juhui, not her. Hanrim turns to the crowd and implores them to intervene. Some of them must be parents, though, are they just going to watch someone's daughter get assaulted like this? The priest laughs and points out that the two adults starting the trashing were Juhui's own parents. Hanrim can only watch in horror as Juhui's parents beat her like a drum. After a few minutes, her parents walk to the side, and the next person to come forward was her little brother, Juhayak. One by one, each member of the congregation steps forward and violently beats on her until Hanrim couldn't take it anymore and warns them that she's going to die. She finally agrees to sign the letter of resignation if they stop targeting Juhui. The priest shares the good news with his followers and exclaims that their miraculous trashing had moved the Red Witch into submission. They then untie one of Hanrim's hands and give her a pen to sign the paper with. In one swift move, Hanrim stabs the pen at the priest's neck and slams him into her knee. His guard is about to hit her when Hanrim warns them that she had stabbed their leader's artery. If she pulls it out, then he dies. With no one in the congregation able to defy her, Hanrim orders one of her guards to untie her and take the unconscious Juhui to the hospital. An hour later, the believers were able to show Hanrim a picture of Juhui safe and sound in a hospital bed, and they demanded that she let their leader go. Hanrim smiles and suddenly pulls out the pen, making the priest panic and run around. However, a few moments later, he notices that blood isn't spewing out of his neck. Hanrim had been bluffing the whole time. But Hanrim isn't done with him just yet as she pummels him once more with heavy strikes, ending with breaking his knee. A believer tries to strike her in the head with a metal pipe, but Hanrim blocks and steals the weapon from her. She then tells them that before she thought they were all victims, but now she knows that they all abuse their children in the name of a cult. As such, she won't go easy on them like she did yesterday. In a flash, she went through them whacking and cracking their bones with her metal pipe. Meanwhile, the priest tries to limp away from her on his broken leg. The priest heads to a nearby greenhouse where the kids are playing. The kids immediately get scared of getting scolded because they are just playing around but the priest just tells them to get their sickles because the red witch is coming. However, it was too late. Hanrim rips apart the greenhouse's walls and approaches them. The kids try to prepare their weapons, but Hanrim easily breaks them apart. The priest tries to limp away again and Hanrim gives chase. She throws the broken edge of a sickle right at the priest's shoulder, stabbing him and causing him to fall to the ground. And yet, he still tries to crawl away while Hanrim slowly walks over with her metal pipe. The priest prays for God to deliver him from this evil, and at that very moment, a motorcycle comes hurtling down the road. It stops in front of him, and the rider removes his helmet. The priest was saved because Jesus himself came to save him. Unfortunately, the reality is that it was Hua Jin looking confused at what he was seeing. The priest bows down before Hua Jin and begs him to smite the witch. However, Hanrin just happily greets Hua Jin, confusing the priest once more. Thus, Hua Jin smacks the priest with his helmet while explaining to Hanrim that he called her emergency contact Suiyan. From her, he learned that Hanrim was worried about a religious group calling schools demons. He forgives her for not contacting him because she wasn't sure of the mission yet, but he also berates her for confronting reclusive organizations by herself. Wajin asks her if it's all over already, but Hanrim tells him that they still have one problem left. Behind them was a wave of kids angrily shouting at them for knocking their savior unconscious. After tying up the kids and interviewing them, Wajin realizes how much the kids were brainwashed. They consider their work at the farm holy work and that they are holy warriors defending their faith. 
Even Juyak denies that he hurt his sister because for him, it was a demon. Hanrim observes that even if they put the cult's leader in prison, they won't know how these kids would fare in the real world. Wajin remarks that as children, they are especially susceptible to brainwashing. However, this can also be hopeful because they are also capable of changing fast. They would surely get better if they separated from the cult in time. But separating them won't be that easy. Even if the leader is in prison, the cult will live on. Hanrim doesn't understand what he's saying, but she finally sees what he means when they exit the building. The cult members are now encircling them begging on their knees for their cult to be freed. Whether their leader is convicted or not, the cult members won't listen to anybody else. If their leader is in prison, they'll campaign to free him. And since this cult has a strong religious focus, they also won't easily give up on their children if they try to separate them. This leaves them with only one choice. Wajin visits the priest in prison and requests him to break up their congregation before he goes to prison. If he does that, they will lighten his sentence. The priest smirks at them and points out that his believers are his strength and shield, so why would he do that? They won't be able to torture him to comply since the government can't do that. Wajin agrees with him that they won't be able to do that, but Hanrim abruptly gives Wajin her signed letter of resignation. With that, she's no longer a member of the government. Wajin smiles and leaves the room, letting the two civilians work things out between themselves. A few minutes later, the priest agrees to break up his congregation. However, Hanrim rejects his offer and tells him that she rather enjoy taking her revenge on him. The next day, the priest stands in front of his congregation once again, this time to break them up. He announces that thanks to their prayers, the holy deity had sent forth his angels and vanquished the demons. Therefore, they don't have any more reason to stay in their little paradise, but instead, head out into the world. The congregation was happy to learn that evil had been vanquished, but the moment their leader starts talking about them leaving, they immediately rebuke his statements. They accuse the priests of being possessed by demons and encourage each other to give him a trashing. Wajin scratches his head in frustration since he realized that it wasn't brainwashing or religious beliefs that kept the cult going. For them, religion isn't faith. It was an escape. The congregation starts beating up the priest in the hopes of driving the demon out of him, but Juhui yells at them that they don't even believe in the religion. Every adult there knows that what they're doing is wrong, but they just keep doing it because they don't want to go back to the real world. They were all defeated in all areas of life, so when some random priest starts calling them chosen ones, they cling to that illusion. She shouts at her parents that they were just there because their restaurant business was on the verge of shutting down, so they ran away like losers. Her father charges at Juhui, but Juhui abruptly slams him. She then grabs her little brother and tells her parents that they were the ones who chose to join a cult, not them. They can keep living there all they like, but they are leaving. Jayek asks his sister if the demons are truly vanquished and Juhui sadly explains to him that there were no demons in the first place. Only a con artist who Hanrim promptly cuffs. A few months later, the priest, with his vast wealth from his followers, hired the best lawyers in the country. However, the TRPA witnessed everything in the cult firsthand and refuted all their arguments. Outside the courthouse, the priest's followers are still rallying for the release of their leader, but the TRPA can't do anything about them. It was their choice. It was enough that they were able to separate them from their kids. Hanrim felt disappointed at this, but Juhui sent her a picture of all of them studying and it can't help but make Hanrim smile. Meanwhile, Huijin also receives a call, and he quickly heads back to the courthouse. Somewhere in Korea, Don Kiel Go receives his first salary as a full-time employee of the construction company Huijin introduced him to way back then. Huijin then arrives and hands Don Kiel a letter, telling him that he has some good news. The news reports that it's been one year since the launch of the TRPA, they started by arresting the politician Kwang Pil Ryu's bully son, and now they are even taking down cults confining children. All over Korea, students talk about the TRPA, it's not sure if the TRPA lowered the rate of violations against the right to education. But students now expect the TRPA to show up if someone crosses the line. But where are the people who the TRPA had saved? Hyeonju has now graduated from Guwon Tech and been hired by a major company, prompting his past bullies to happily celebrate with him. In prison, Mr. Go's wife visits Yeri and asks her to stop sending any more letters. She points out that Yeri doesn't look sorry in her pictures with the TRPA and Yeri explains that she was just helping runaway teens then. Mr. Go's wife commends Yeri for helping people worse off than her and asks Yeri to stop by her place when she's finally released from prison and she'll welcome her with a warm meal. 
On an island somewhere, residents are still trying to extort money from newcomers to the island, but a huge man nicknamed Whale tells them to back off. Meanwhile, Mr. Lee continues his crusade against the TRPA, writing articles and reports against them. Yunha is now the captain of the baseball team. Ms. Sanghee is teaching gender equality. The cult leader meets Mr. Chian in prison. And the 14-year-old Ju Wong truly ended up back in juvenile detention. Meanwhile, Miss Choi and Eugene's mom are now on friendly terms, and the runaway teens are going to school. Lastly, Dong Chiel is finally reunited with Min Seo, his son. Wejin happily watches Dong Chiel walk away with his son when Gang Shou calls him and berates him for not going back to work. Thus, Wejin goes back to work, not knowing until when the TRPA can exist, but he decides to do his best and help as much as he can until it still does. Thanks for watching. If you like the content, give a like and subscribe for more videos. See you next time.